so for the audience, we're going to administer the oath of office to Cadet Stone. And it's uh, a big deal to put it in plain language. And think about the words as I say them. Because too often we just roll through these words and we don't think about the words. I ask you to think about each word of the oath this young man is taking to serve his country. Cadet Stone, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, state your full name. I, Matthew Ryan Stone. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear? That I will support and defend the Constitution. That I will support and defend the Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will obey the orders of the President. That I will obey the orders of the President. Of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me. Of the United States and of the officers appointed over me. According to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. According to the regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. So help me God. I just want to say how thankful I am as a military police officer, enlisted, and come up the ranks a little bit, not as much as an admiral, but to be assigned here to work with these cadets and have the uh, honor to be standing with an admiral and the Coast Guard to do this for one of our cadets. I know you're a very busy man. I know Cadet Stone is very, very appreciative of it. You, man. And uh, you're welcome. we thank you for your service, man. We thank you for coming to Winthrop, and, uh, and we appreciate it. Thank you for supporting the ROTC program. In 2016, um, I plan on uh, you know, becoming an officer within the Army. I'm truly grateful for, um, for Admiral to be here and to, um, to administer this at the office. from humanitarian service, such as search and rescue. In fact, off the coast of North Carolina just a year ago, the HMS Bounty sank, and it was Coast Guard rescue helicopters that searched and actually did save uh, some people on that crew. We do law enforcement, such as fisheries enforcement, to preserve our natural resources and to deter against illegal incursions into our country. In addition, we secure the nation's ports and waterways against threats that can be delivered from the sea. We respond to man-made disasters. We were the front and center in the Hurricane Katrina disaster in the Deepwater Horizon uh, most recently down in the, the Gulf Coast. And uh, believe it or not, we help defend our nation overseas. We have patrol boats that are serving in the Persian Gulf as we speak. Those are 110-foot boats, captained by a young lieutenant who is probably only uh, 26 uh, or 7 years old, commanding a patrol boat over there in the uh, Persian Gulf. I went in 1978 to the Coast Guard Academy, and I ended up choosing the Coast Guard over the Navy because when I looked at both schools, the Naval Academy, uh, its women graduating, uh, weren't allowed to serve in combat ships. They were excluded by Title X, the combat exclusion law. And under Title XIV in the Coast Guard, we had no such combat exclusion law, so we had uh, and still have 378-foot light frigate-style ships that were armed with at the time, we had Harpoon and Sea Whiz missiles on uh, some of those for a while, but those ships were open to women. So there was no jobs that women were excluded from serving when they graduated. So I chose the Coast Guard because I wanted uh, to have equal access uh, for putting in the same hard work. So I came into Coast Guard Academy in a third class of women. Women made up just 5% of the cadet population in those days. And I was a senior boarding officer and the only woman on the ship. So it's Pacific Northwest and we're boarding the fishing fleet. And there was a, that's another part of the country that has different mindsets about culture. And so people were telling me you'll never, you know, you're never gonna be able to have respect going on a fishing boat because you're a woman and they're not gonna respect you going on there, telling them what the rules are and how they're supposed to comply. So I, without really knowing it at the time, I was convinced I wasn't gonna let gender define me and I was gonna be my own person. So I uh, did 
did go on board those, those boats, those fishing boats, with all male crews on those boats. Guys had been out to sea for a week or two or three fishing. And uh, I would announce that I was coming, and we, I'd be the first one on board with a boarding party behind me. And um, I'd walk on board, I was pleasant to them, I uh, greeted them courteously. And the first thing we had to do for officer safety was ask if they had any weapons. So I'd ask them first off, do you have, do you have any guns? Now if a guy goes on board, a fishing boat, and it's all men crew, and a man, a male enforcement officer asks a, a male fisherman, can I see your guns? That's a threat kind of, you know? It's like, that's my guns, you know, it's my personal weapons. And there's a, conf a conflict right away. But when I went on board, as a female, Young, I was young in those days. And I smiled at them, can I see your guns? They're like, what else can I show you? I'll show you, you want to see my fish? You want to see my log entries? I um, excelled as a boarding officer <laughs> because I used my gender to my advantage. And I didn't let people tell me you're not going to be able to go on board there.